Hello everyone, it's Friday at 12 Central, so we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Larissa DeLuna with the American Heart Association, and I'd like to welcome you to the American Heart Association Stroke Webinar Series. These educational webinars are being brought to you by the Southwest Affiliate Stroke Committee. For a full list of upcoming webinars, visit heart.org slash SWA quality. Today's webinar topic is the triage of acute stroke using reperfusion processing for thrombolytic selection. Excuse me. Before getting started, we'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. To avoid background noise, all lines have been placed on mute. For questions, you can unmute your line by pressing star six or type in the Q&A section of WebEx. Although this event is not accredited for CME slash CE credits, attendees will receive a certificate of participation as proof of attendance. All slides, handouts, and the participation certificates will be sent to attendees within two weeks of today's call. Today's speaker is Dr. Rajan Gadia. Dr. Gadia is a born and raised native of Houston, Texas, who graduated medical school from Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. He then went on to complete his neurology residency at Houston Methodist Hospital and received his final training in vascular neurology at Massachusetts General and Brigham and Women's Hospitals in Boston. Dr. Gadia then returned to Houston Methodist to join the Eddie Skurlock Stroke Center. In addition to his clinical practice, he serves as program director for the Vascular Neurology Fellowship and as associate program director of, neuro of the Neurology Residency Program. He also helped start and grow the acute teleneurology and telestroke program within the Houston Methodist system and now serves as director of teleneurology. He co-chairs the ELVO Task Force, a multi-specialty and multidisciplinary group that develops and modifies protocols for stroke patients presenting with large vessel, vessel occlusion. He also serves as the medical director for the Houston Methodist Concussion Center and is a member of the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, Stroke Affiliate Committee. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Gaudia. Thank you so much, Larissa, for that uh, introduction. I hope everyone can hear me clearly, and I thank you for joining for today's webinar series. Um, I want to start out by going a little bit over the topic, but really giving credit to uh, someone here who's with me uh, uh, on, on this end, uh, one of my stroke fellows, Dr. Kyle Boca, who's really helped in doing a lot of the groundwork and the research alongside with me, uh, really used it as a learning tool, and uh, certainly hope that he can, as a trainee in, uh, in future practice, can contribute to the AHA as well. So today we're going to be talking about the triage of acute stroke using perfusion processing for thrombectomy selection. We're going to also talk a little bit about th uh, thrombolytic selection. Uh, we're going to touch on RAPID and some other softwares that are commercially available now, uh, both automated and semi-automated. And a lot of that will be towards the end of the presentation. I want to start off with some basics uh, for the use of uh, perfusion imaging and triage of acute stroke patients. So some of the objectives, we're going to discuss the utility of perfusion imaging in patients presenting with acute stroke symptoms. We're going to go over some basics of perfusion imaging parameters, probably more than any of you ever want to know, uh, regarding the basic physics of perfusion imaging. Uh, the overview of currently available perfusion imaging software, and we're going to talk about future applications of perfusion imaging. So to start, <clears throat> uh, stroke continues to be the leading cause of disability in adults. Uh, in developed countries, the fifth leading cause of mortality uh, in the state. Um, initial imaging assessments are no longer restricted to just non-contrast CT scan, which we have been cardinally used to uh, since the advent of TPA and, uh, and Altaplace back in 1995. Uh, but CT angiography, as of the uh, 2015 study, showing the benefit of thrombectomy in the uh, in-window population within six hours. We're going much past that. We're using advanced imaging tests, including uh, MR imaging as well as CT perfusion imaging to try to characterize time based on tissue and based on imaging characteristics. Perfusion studies can help define the extent of ischemic injury uh, in the stroke patient. It always allows for assessment of, uh, or an estimation at least for infarct core based on CT perfusion, truly an infarct core based on the gold standard DWI through MRI and then both can give an estimate as to the penumbra or salvageable tissue, uh, often also indicating the level of arterial occlusion. So this is one of my favorite slides. Really takes us through the timeline of all the acute stroke, or I would say the most important of the acute stroke uh, therapy trials. 
starting back in 1995, you can see on the left-hand side, with the NINDS TPA study showing the benefit of intravenous alteplase up to three hours from last known well. <clears throat> and really was the first sort of uh, trial to show that we had a therapy to offer to our acute stroke patients, an acute time-based uh, lytic therapy to offer to our, our stroke patients. Our colleagues in Europe then did the ECAS-3 study and presented their results, extending the time window from three to four and a half hours uh, from last known well, and that was published in September of 2008. And you can see that that was uh, a good amount of time where we were using this lytic therapy. It was an exciting time uh, in the world of stroke, and then we had a, a time window that was extended out to four and a half hours. We slowly switched gears within the field to endovascular studies, and unfortunately we had a number of negative studies showing no benefit and even some harm to doing endovascular thrombectomy and really put the paradigm uh, back into the uh, court of lytic therapy. The investigators, not only neurosurgeons, vascular neurologists, ER doctors, radiologists, and so on and so forth, but the designers of trials realized that it's all about patient selection, having the appropriate inclusion and exclusion criteria to come up uh, with an appropriate study that can have the uh, ability to show benefit. And the investigators did just that, and in January of 2015, we had the first positive endovascular study with MR Clean. The results uh, presented showing the benefit of endovascular thrombectomy when uh, completed within six hours of last known well. Soon followed suit were uh, multiple additional trials in 2015 and 2016 confirming the benefit of endovascular thrombectomy within uh, six hours of a last known well. And of course, pushing the envelope further, uh, nearly a year later, in November of 2017, we had the first extended window thrombectomy study that was published showing the benefit of thrombectomy in carefully selected patient population based on clinical radiological mismatch between the six to 24 hour window. This was confirmed by another end, uh, extended window endovascular study, the Diffuse 3 study. Uh, the first time uh, I have ever sort of experience where we had a landmark clinical trial that was presented at an international stroke conference. Uh, a few minutes later was published in the New England Journal of Medicine online, and then minutes later the AHA ASA stroke guidelines were updated showing, uh, reflecting the uh, change in guideline management to a level 1A indication as standard of care for these extended window patients. Um, since that time, obviously people have been pushing the window and trying to fill in the gray areas as to where, where do we stop with, with thrombectomy. And there are ongoing studies to really answer that question based on is there truly a ceiling for the time window um, or can these uh, imaging parameters really take, uh, take charge of making that determination for you. Uh, in May of 2018, now this is after the stroke <clears throat> guidelines were presented in January, uh, we had uh, published a new, uh, a new study was published, the wake-up study showing the benefit of intravenous TPA based on MRI characteristics, the dif difference between MRI, DWI, or diffusion-weighted imaging, and flare mismatch in patients greater than 4.5 hours from last known well. And there are ongoing studies with Alteplase as well as with other lytic agents uh, around the world. The modified rank and scale score, <clears throat> many of you are familiar with this. This is sort of the cardinal measure of disability in most acute stroke trials, ranging from zero to six. The higher the number, the more deficits a patient has. Generally measured at the 90-day mark, but oftentimes collected uh, pre-morbid as well as at discharge, uh, but really within the clinical trials looking at the outcome measure at 90 days. And what we tend to define as good outcome across the board of, uh, for majority of these acute clinical stroke studies is an MRS of two or less, and I'll show you that in the next few slides. So here's that slide uh, showing those, uh, those same studies uh, pictorially with a breakdown in modified rank skin scale scores, sometimes referred to as carotograms. And you can see generally the treatment group is on top, uh, with the exception of the 1995 study, the treatment group is on the bottom, and you can really see a leftward shift towards the lower modified rank scale scores showing the benefit of each of these treatments from uh, TPA, the ECAS study, the endovascular studies, and then uh, concluding there with the wake-up uh, trial with extended window thrombolytic therapy. So where are we now? We are extending the window, and here you see the face of three New England Journal of Medicine articles, Don, Diffuse 3, and Wake Up, really saying we are at a time point where the clinical history, as it's served as the cardinal measure to to determine 
what endovascular or what thrombolytic uh, therapy is available to a patient, we are now moving towards more of an imaging characteristic to help with the time window, to help either uh, supplement the time window or help altogether with replace the time window. So here's a slide taken from an American Heart Association uh, uh, talk given uh, in the last few months looking at the benefit of advanced imaging uh, for patient selection in the 6 to 24 hour group. And the two RCTs that we talked about were Don and Diffuse 3. You can see that both trials showed a large benefit for thrombectomy, the Don study showing 49% versus 13%, and that's that MRS 0 to 2 that we discussed as good outcome or has been well accepted as uh, being a good outcome post-intervention, and diffuse 3 showing 45% versus 17% good outcome. And you can see that uh, CT perfusion as well as MRI, MR perfusion were both used um, within the Don study, only required infarct core, so you could get away without any perfusion imaging. Uh, if you used MRI, you could just go by the DWI and infarct core size. Uh, alternatively, you could use the infarct core based on CT perfusion, uh, whereas diffuse 3 really required both uh, a perfusion, you needed a radiological mismatch in addition to the clinical history. So here it is, the, uh, a snapshot of the 2018 AHA ASA stroke guidelines showing uh, level 1A recommendation for those patients presenting with an acute ischemic stroke, focal neurologic deficits with an NIH stroke scale um, generally greater than or equal to 6, uh, as was used in the diffuse 3 trial. Uh, varied depending on the DON characteristics based on age parameters as well as infarct core. But in those patients that are presenting within the 6 to 24 hour window with an LVO, a large vessel occlusion confirmed in the anterior circulation, um, obtaining a CT perfusion or a DWI MRI with or without perfusion imaging is recommended to help in selecting for extended window mechanical thrombectomy when all the other criteria uh, based on the randomized clinical trials uh, were met. So really landmark changes in the in the clinical in the uh, stroke guidelines there. Let's shift gears now into perfusion imaging. I'm going to spend just the next 10 to 20 minutes or so going over some perfusion imaging background as well as the common parameters that we come across. Uh, and I'm going to help try my best to be a radiological physicist to try to explain some of those parameters. Um, at the National Institutes of Health uh, in the 1940s, Seymour Ketty and Carl Schmidt published Initially, studies of cerebral blood flow and oxygen metabolism. This was the basis for cerebral perfusion imaging. And Leon Axel published a lot of this with use of early deconvolution models for CT perfusion imaging. Um, unfortunately, during the 80s, we had limitations due to slow speeds of commercially available scanners and data processing systems, as many of you can imagine, um, was a significant delay to actually using computers to calculate these algorithms and come up with perfusion maps. So basics of perfusion. Perfusion is physiologically defined as the steady state delivery of blood to some element of tissue. And when we're, we're talking, we're talking about the element of tissue that's involved or implicated as being penumbra or infarct core. We use it to determine blood volume, blood velocity, also known as the blood flow, and blood oxygenation. And this can be acquired now non-invasively through the use of CT perfusion and MR perfusion imaging. So let's go over some of these basic principles. We've all heard the terms time to peak, cerebral blood volume, blood flow, Tmax, and mean transit time. So what do they really mean? And I'm going to try to show you pictorially what, the, what those uh, fundamental uh, brain perfusion principles truly mean. How do we define them? The fundamentals consist of defining the signal intensity on MRI or the CT attenuation of contrast. This is a change in intensity based on MR or contrast with CT within a given voxel as a function of time, whether you're looking at the artery, whether you're looking at the basal ganglia, uh, gray matter, white matter, what have you. We're looking at some change in intensity of signal, whether it's contrast or through MR signal um, uh, over uh, time. In CT, it's measured in the arteries as well as in the parenchyma, uh, in, the, in the tissue of interest. In the arteries, we obtain an arterial input function, which I'll show you on the next slide. The arterial input function is a concentration time curve of the contrast agent as it's given and as it's measured through an arterial vessel. The parenchyma is looking at the actual concentration over time in the tissue of interest, uh, presumably the infarcted or the ischemic tissue. And additionally, we get a third curve called the venous output function, this is not used 
specifically or directly to determine perfusion of the brain, but it's actually used to standardize the arterial input function to make sure that uh, because the arterial input functions are generally smaller caliber arterial vessels, uh, it's used to con uh, control for the partial volume artifacts that can, uh, that can occur. And then this signal, once we have it in the arteries as well as in the parenchyma, is then converted into contrast concentration as a function over time. So here are those five parameters again. Let's start with the time to peak. This is the time when the maximum concentration is reached. It's going to be different for the vessel. It's going to be different for the tissue. So initially, longer times to peak were thought to be uh, decreased blood flow states or tissues at risk for infarction. But it turns out you're going to have a longer time to peak when you've got actually symmetric collaterals because by definition, you have multiple pathways for blood flow to flow to get to a piece of tissue at the maximum concentration. And so it's not equivalent to say that a longer time to peak is truly an infarcted tissue. It may be perfectly healthy tissue with uh, excellent symmetric uh, collaterals. Um, cerebral blood volume, it's defined as the volume of blood flowing through a given volume of brain measured in mLs per 100 grams of brain tissue. It's the area under the first path concentration time curve. And uh, if you look over to the right, you can see that uh, the cerebral blood volume is labeled as that curve underneath. And you can see on the left-hand side of the curve, you can see where it starts and where that curve ends. It never really gets to that baseline. And the reason for that is because there's continuous recirculation of blood and it's corrupted because by the time you get to the end of the curve, there's recirculation of another uh, bolus, another cardiac output cycle has taken place and you've got uh, arterial flow at the very end. So what you do is you sort of mark off at the beginning of that second curve and create, calculate the volume below the curve between the initial onset uh, towards uh, until the uh, input of the second phase of arterial flow. This has been shown to be the most reproducible parameter across multiple software uh, vendors. Unfortunately, it's not the most accurate in determining uh, infarct core or penumbra, as we'll, as we'll address in a little bit uh, as well. To measure an area under the curve, manufacturers, as I said, will use a uh, arbitrary line at the end of the uh, first curve and prior to the second curve. And this, is, uh, this area is the approximation of cerebral blood volume. The concentration curves can differ by location. I told you that you can get the concentration curve in the artery, in the vein, as well as in the tissue. The shape of the curve is going to be different because these are actual calculations in the artery, the gray matter, and the white matter. And why is this important? Tissues that show slow flow will actually artificially have a smaller area under the curve. And the curve in the artery will generally stop prior to the tissue, the, the curve in the tissue because flow has, uh, has uh, left the artery and is now sitting in the capillaries, which is really what you're looking at within the tissue flow. And because of this, you can really underestimate the uh, cerebral blood volume, as you can see the difference there where the artery, the purple curve ends and where the tissue curve ends. Reduced cerebral blood flow induces vasodilation. This is sort of a general not natural process of autoregulation within the brain. Did we lose you, Dr. Gaudian? Dr. Gaudian, I think you might have muted your line again. We, we can't hear you. Sorry, right, everyone. We seem to be having some technical difficulty. Dr. Gadia, if you can unmute your line, 
Sorry, everyone. Let me um, reach out to Dr. Gaudia and see what's going on with our, our phone lines. I apologize. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Sorry. Did everyone get, seems like everyone might have gotten kicked off for some reason. Okay. Um, I'm not sure where, where that may have uh, taken place. Um, I'm going can to back, you go back One more slide. If you can go back one more slide and repeat, I think that's when I lost. I lost okay. you. Okay, great. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't think it was your fault. I think it was technical issues. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's go back to uh, this concentration uh, curve. They can differ by the location within the brain. The shape of the curve is going to be different in an artery as it will be in the gray matter and white matter. And why is this important? It's because the tissues that show slow flow will artificially have a smaller area under the curve. And you can see that because the arterial flow is going to send blood flow into the, uh, the capillary vessels, and that's what you're looking at within the tissue. That's the flow through the tissue. Because of this, because we are measuring the, the flow in the tissues, you're grossly underestimating cerebral blood volume. And we'll talk a little bit about ways, the algorithms that have been developed to try to make up for this underestimation in cerebral blood volume. So the natural autoregulation process within the brain in a normal, healthy individual, when you have a reduction in cerebral blood flow, this is due to an acute occlusion, can induce vasodilatation, uh, which increases cerebral blood volume to maintain the cerebral blood flow. In the, in the brain, if the vessels are under some sort of stress, they'll vasodilate in that area locally to try to maintain the blood volume. But if we get to a critical level, the cerebral blood flow continues to drop, you lose autoregulation, and subsequently the, sub uh, the cerebral blood volume, in addition, will drop. And when you have a drop in cerebral blood volume, in addition to cerebral blood flow, that is much more of an indication of true infarction. Still, we may be underestimating the cerebral blood volume for everything that I just mentioned above. So let's move to cerebral blood flow. This is defined as the volume of blood moving through a given volume of brain over a specific amount of time. It's measured in units of mLs of blood per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. And the steeper the curve, the higher the blood flow, okay? And you can see that there are things that can affect the, the steepness of that curve or the, the cerebral blood flow. Uh, one of that is the injection rate of the contrast. And you can see that in the purple, it's given at a faster injection rate, twice injection rate, and thus the cerebral blood flow is much higher, uh, as you can see, compared to the steepness of the curve, which is much less than the yellow curve when given at a slower rate, okay? Other things that can affect, or other factors that can affect the curve are the type of contrast. Uh, for example, the viscosity, the higher the viscosity, the slower the cerebral blood flow. The injection rate, as we just talked about, the injection volume. Having uh, stenosis or collaterals, the angioarchitecture, the number of vessels or the type of vessels that the uh, contrast is given through can affect uh, the curves, as well as intravenous mixing. For es better estimation of the cerebral blood flow, deconvolution algorithms can be used. And I'm going to do my best to try to keep this as simple as possible, not being a physicist. But deconvolution algorithms can solve complex equations. Radiologists, physicists use this quite frequently. When they want to use or convert concentration time curves within the tissue and the artery into meaningful cleaning, uh, clinical parameters. So, what we're trying to calculate is something called the residue function. We know the, the, the flow through an artery based on the measures that we talked about. We know the flow through, the through tissue or the region of interest based on the measures that we just talked about. What we want to know is the combination. What's the residue function to truly know what the penumbral tissue is doing and what the infarct core is doing? And so the basic principle is you're using two functions to solve for a third function. So after measuring the arterial input function, as you can see there on the left, you can also get the contrast signal in tissue over time. This is the capillary flow and the perfusion. Um, that's the tissue concentration of the curve in yellow. You can use a deconvolution method to solve for the third part of the equation, which is the residue function. That's the one in the middle there. And you can see the different uh, factors or the, the different uh, uh, terms that the cerebral blood flow, the mean transit time, which is the volume underneath that curve, and then the Tmax. 
So the residue function is a curve representing the signal contrast within the voxel of interest, okay? Voxel is just, a, really think of it as a pixel in, in the actual imaging or the tissue of, uh, of interest. And this can help determine the cerebral blood flow. You can get from it a, the Tmax, the time to maximum residue function, which is commonly used uh, for determining penumbra, as well as the mean transit time, which is also commonly used for defining penumbra, and sometimes in addition to other measures to define the infarct core. So the Tmax, as you can imagine, we just talked about using a deconvoluted algorithm or an algorithm to solve for this. It's not a true physiologic value. It's a calculated or a theoretical construct uh, reflecting the bolus arrival from artery to the parenchyma, to the tissue. And it reflects the delay from arterial uh, input function to the tissue, okay? It increases, uh, or increases in Tmax represent a delayed and diminished collateral circulation. Uh, there's no real difference between white and gray matter because it's a uh, it's calculated and measure. And generally, depending on the softwares, the automated or the semi-automated, and from institution to institution, uh, Tmax is generally higher than four to six seconds is a good predictor of critically hypoperfused tissue that may be destined for infarction uh, or penumbra, okay? And it's, this has been used and studied in subgroup analyses of multiple studies, including those that mentioned their diffuse, MR rescue, extend IA, and so on and so forth. If you look at the curves on the right, you can really see the times to peak. The time to peak is the time it takes to get peak concentration uh, level at the tissue. Um, and then after the deconvolution method, you can see that the curves look very different because you're taking into account both, both the arterial input function as well as the tissue uh, uh, flow and the tissue a perfusion to get the cerebral blood flow, which you can calculate the area. If you get the area underneath the curve, you can calculate the cerebral blood volume. Um, and then based on those two measures, the mean transit time is equal to the cerebral blood volume divided by the cerebral blood flow. So the mean transit time, the last sort of measure that we uh, harp on, um, it's defined as the average amount of time that it takes blood to transit through the given volume of brain expressed in seconds, okay? The measure of time. Once again, it's a calculated measure based on a theoretical construct. Thus, there's no gray or white matter differences. And this is truly a measure of the microvasculature, the capillary circulation within the tissue of interest. Okay? And it can be calculated through a concentration time curve based on the cerebral blood volume and blood flow, as I mentioned in the previous slide. The mean transit time is equal to this measure of cerebral blood volume divided by blood flow. So you get a one over one divided by time, which gives you time. Uh, which is that mean transit time uh, measure. This is dependent on the injection kinetics as we talked about, the viscosity, the injection rate, uh, stenosis, collaterals, that sort of thing. The mean transit time can also be calculated as the weighted average of the area underneath the curve, as you can see there in purple. Um, and it's just like the Tmax can oftentimes be used to identify tissue at risk for infarct or penumbra. So now let's switch gears and talk a little bit about CT and MR perfusion. So CT perfusion, the role of CT perfusion in acute stroke setting has continued to grow. And why is this? Uh, it's because of the it's distinct advantages of CT. Cost relatively of the scanners is much less. It's widely available, certainly in all stroke centers, and the ease of patient monitoring because it's a short study, okay? Now there's become widespread use of DWI, but oftentimes there's limitations with ruling out contraindications to getting an MRI, it's difficulty in getting an MRI uh, urgently with a, over a 24-hour period, and for that reason, oftentimes CT has that advantage. CT perfusion and CTA can be performed rapidly following a non-contrast CT, so it just takes in the order of a couple of minutes. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it generally uh, always requires a second contrast bolus in addition to the CTA uh, to get perfusion imaging, although there are newer scanners being developed to try to avoid the need for a second contrast bolus. Sometimes what takes place of that is using a surrogate measure, which is multi-phase CTA, scanning over a single bolus of contrast to try to estimate the perfusion deficit uh, with delayed imaging. And then the manual post-processing, which is what majority of the softwares that are available on CT scanners, whether you're dealing with Siemens, GE, Philips, what have you, is the manual post-processing time, which can be done by the radiology tech or the radiologist themselves. It can take upwards of 10 minutes. And this is where a lot of the delays, unfortunately, in perfusion imaging come from. Perfusion studies can further improve detection of the infarct and truly widen the time window, not only for endovascular therapy, but for thrombolytic therapy 
um, as we will discuss and kind of alluded to within the first uh, two or three timeline slides. So back to MR perfusion. <clears throat> the DWI sequence was a diffusion-weighted image. Sequence visualizes ischemic necrosis in the form of cytotoxic edema. So really when you get a DWI change, what you're truly looking for is swelling of the cells, the swelling of the glial and the neuronal cells, which allow for diffusion restriction. That's what gives you the uh, intensity on diffusion-weighted imaging. From that, you get a calculated image called the uh, apparent diffusion coefficient or the ADC image, which is what majority of the automated softwares I'll talk about later use to define infarct core. Um, we need to avoid confusion mismatch with penumbra. Criteria vary based on software. One of the ones that we found sometimes we'll use a perfusion deficit for using a Tmax over uh, two seconds, as well as uh, the caveat of having a size greater than 20% greater than that measured in the uh, diffusion sequence. Others will use a Tmax of greater than six seconds, as does Rapid and some of the other softwares. And it can give you an estimate of the volume of penumbra. You can see there on the left uh, in the image is the diffusion weighted image, a small area of infarct and a large perfusion weighted deficit, truly uh, a, a significant amount of tissue that has uh, uh, advantage to be potentially amenable to thrombectomy if a large vessel occlusion is truly present. And you can see that automated maps can calculate that, that mismatch between perfusion deficit and diffusion uh, in part volume. The Tmax reflects the bolus delay between the site of the artery as well as the tissue as we talked about. And the delay of greater than six seconds is generally thought to be a good predictor of hypoperfused tissue. Uh, that is destined for infarction. The disadvantage is that the calculation this still does require selecting for an arterial input function for which there's user variability as well as automated software variability. And then the deconvolution algorithm is very sensitive to even minor changes in the shapes of the arterial input function. It's very important to look at the, the raw mass of the arterial input function, the tissue uh, perfusion, as well as the uh, venous outflow uh, function to ensure you have a good study. So a little comparison between CTP and MRI. There are some, uh, some significant limitations of CT perfusion. There's a false positive that's been documented in many, many studies as well uh, for low CBF uh, or cerebral blood flow in white matter for two reasons, one of which uh, we commonly see in the aging population is areas of leukoareosis. So a reduction in chronic cerebral blood flow in areas of leukoareosis. And then the low contrast to noise ratio of CT perfusion compared with MRI uh, given the physiological gradient between cerebral blood flow uh, in gray and white matter. The times to peak can be delayed in leukoareosis as a result of the low uh, cerebral blood flow, whereas in MRI, MR perfusion, when you get the gold standard DWI image, you truly have an identification of infarct core. Um, the problem is there's restricted access, as we talked about, to urgent MRI, and then there are many contraindications, whether it's old pacemaker placement or uh, gunshot wounds or any sort of metal that... Uh, that restricts the use of MRI in certain patients. Certainly gadolinium use in ESRD or in stage renal disease is a, is a big restriction of MR perfusion as well. So let's talk a little bit about core and penumbra. Uh, in the setting of an acute infarction, infarcted tissue has decreased cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume with a corresponding increase in mean transit time. That's pretty much as specific as you can get for true core. Now, what you define as the thresholds is what varies from software to software, varies from institution to institution, varies from physicist to physicist, and, and there's not really been a good consensus other than the potentially the three automated softwares that I'll, I'll talk about in just a bit. Severe decreases in cerebral blood volume are particularly sensitive and specific for defining the extent of an unsalvageable core. And in an acute stroke, it's possible to have regions that show decreased cerebral blood flow, so these acute areas where you've got an occlusion with lack of blood flow, but you've maintained cerebral blood volume as a result of autoregulation uh, in that area due to vasodilatation. Um, these are areas where we can truly have potential for salvaging tissue, and this is defined as the penumbra the, there in the green, as you can see. These areas are characterized by prolonged mean transit times. Generally, the mean transit times for Tmax is, uh, if you want to put a, a number to a Tmax is greater than uh, six, or mean transit times greater than. 145% to the contralateral uh, tissue uh, beyond areas of core infarct. And this is also referred to as the blood volume to mean transit time mismatch. So visual inspection, this is a snapshot of a, of a rapid uh, 
uh, algorithm output. And sometimes just seeing something visually can truly really help uh, give you a good sense of how much tissue has been implicated as core and how much tissue do we have to save. Obviously beneficial is the co uh, quantification, which Rapid and uh, many of the other softwares will also give you in, in terms of MLs and uh, calculate over a mismatch ratio. So the vis visual inspections, not only of CTP color maps, but also for uh, ADC on MRI as well as Tmax maps for perfusion imaging on MRI can be effective in identifying core and penumbra and help, and they may be sufficient to guide decisions on intervention. Um, not every semi-automated software is going to give you a volume. You may only get a map and you're going to have to estimate based on your sort of either, either visual inspection or an ABC divided by two sort of way to uh, estimate the, the volume of infarct or the volume of penumbra. And the visual inspection obviously has the advantage of speed and simplicity, however, it, there's, there's a subjective bias and, de, and dependent to the user interpretation. Um, quantitative CTP and MR per, uh, parameters, on the other hand, are effective in demonstrating truly acute infarction, potentially salvageable tissue. We're just giving a couple of examples that have been used to define um, uh, penumbra and core, and uh, the point I want to make to you in the, in the next uh, five to ten slides is the significant variability from scanner to scanner, from institution to institution, from software to software, um, what they use to define impart core and uh, in, uh, true penumbra, salvageable tissue, based on the actual software itself or the machine itself. Uh, differences in CTP hardware and software can affect quantified metrics. In addition to that, the user, um, the person who's post-processing and selecting the RTLSF function as well as the uh, the, uh, the penumbral or the tissue, the region of interest, uh, can uh, lead to differences in interpretation and volume calculations of perfusion imaging. Some suggest using a CBF threshold of less than 25 to, infarct core, uh, to define infarct core. Rapid, for example, uses a, C, a, a CBF of less than 30. Um, others suggest using a cerebral blood volume of less than 2 mLs. There's no real consensus um, across uh, across the board because it's so variable from uh, scanner to scanner, from uh, institution to institution, from software to software. The penumbra generally is based on mean transit times or T-maxes. Generally a good consensus there with mean transit times greater than 145, 145% or greater than 1.5 times with respect to the healthy contralateral tissue. Um, it can predict the final size of infarction without recanalization as has been studied in, in previous study, uh, has been shown in previous studies as well. So some basics on penumbra uh, versus uh, core based on cerebral blood flow. So normal blood flow, certainly greater than 40, ideally uh, 50 to 55 uh, mLs per 100 grams uh, per minute. Oligemia, uh, when the brain is not happy, but it's still sufficient to uh, uh, conduct no usual normal uh, biochemical processes, 20 to 40. Truly getting to penumbra, now we're talking about salvageable tissue, tissue that has the potential for benefit with intervention is 10 to 20 and true ischemia less than 10 mLs per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. And the CBF, of course, varies according to age and is three times as high in the gray matter uh, than in the white matter due to metabolic demands, of course. So let's talk about some clinical applications of, of uh, using perfusion imaging. And we're going to touch on a little bit of everything. Here I'm simply showing an algorithm that we use with an hour um, system, our hub and spoke model, as well as when we cover as a tertiary referral center for uh, transfers that may be coming in. Obviously, this has been uh, sort of a conundrum for many uh, hospital systems uh, that are dealing with these patients is when, how do you triage those patients that are going to have the high pretest probability for coming in and benefiting from intervention because we know that the likelihood of having rapid or perfusion availability at every freestanding ER or every, you know, acute stroke ready hospital or certainly every known stroke center is going to be very little. And so how do we know which patients to bring into those centers that are capable of having this rapid interpretation of perfusion imaging? And we have a time-based algorithm. Certainly those within the four and a half hours are always triaged towards TPA, but if vessel image shows large vessel occlusion up to six hours, those patients are brought in for thrombectomy without any need for perfusion imaging if they meet otherwise all uh, the necessary criteria for thrombectomy. Those patients in the extended window, certainly if they have a uh, what we consider to be an appropriate aspect score of seven or greater, um, 
sort of institutionally based there uh, meets the clinical criteria based on the NIH stroke scale minimum and uh, otherwise meets criteria that we would suspect for Donner Diffuse 3 without having the actual imaging uh, characteristics or the perfusion characteristics, those patients are brought in and sent for rapid evaluation. Um, our institution does use rapid uh, software for evaluation. Prior to that, we were using our own in-house uh, CT scanner-based software with manual or semi-automated perfusion map calculation, and then uh, the, uh, the, the volumes were calculated based on uh, interpretation based on ABC divided by two models. So <clears throat> patient selection, obviously the optimal imaging profile for an endovascular patient would be one who clearly has a large vessel occlusion, an anterior circulation large vessel occlusion, a small core, symmetric collaterals, and large penumbra. That's the patient where I think we can say it would be sort of the perfect setup for having benefit with, uh, with thrombectomy has been shown in, uh, in many studies now. Previous stroke trials have led to an understanding uh, of the roles of the blood vessel itself, the core, the penumbra, as well as collateral imaging, and this is all through subgroup analyses of the large clinical trials that we alluded to earlier. So for patient selection, time, time, time still remains a cardinal measure. Of course, it's going to trump virtually anything that we have if we have a time indication as to the onset and, uh, and the last known well of a patient's uh, symptoms. So time from onset of focal cerebral ischemia to reperfusion is fundamental in determining the therapeutic efficacy for reperfusion therapy. This is not something where you really want to be dragging your feet um, in determining whether perfusion is really needed, and then once you have the perfusion imaging, sort of a wait and watch approach doesn't really make sense because things can change second by second, minute by minute. So we talked a little bit uh, already about the utility of perfusion imaging in thrombectomy. The Don and Diffuse three studies have clearly uh, shown the benefit of using perfusion imaging to uh, guide uh, patient selection, inclusion, and exclusion criteria for patients that will benefit from extended window thrombectomy. Both used uh, CT perfusion as well as MR diffusion perfusion. Keep in mind that the Don study just required an infarct core, so you could do that with CT perfusion parameters for core um, or through a DWI MRI. Diffuse 3 did require a perfusion image so that you have true radiological mismatch not a clinical radiological mismatch as was required with Don. <clears throat> um, the AHA ASA guidelines in 2018 recommend CT perfusion and MR perfusion for selecting patients with a large vessel occlusion in six to 24 hours, and we've, I think, uh, beat that dead horse. We've met, uh, uh, made that very clear that this is a level 1A recommendation and certainly should be offered to all those that meet criteria. Here are the specific criteria, um, which many of you are familiar with. The Don uh, trial criteria was age-based. The older you are, sort of the less give you had. You had to have a smaller infarct to meet criteria, um, and uh, uh, at least an NIH scale greater than 10, whereas the younger patients were given larger volumes of infarct and larger NIH stroke scales um, for potential intervention uh, based on infarct core. Diffuse 3 had fairly simple criteria, age less than 90, NIH stroke scales greater than or equal to 6 in a core less than 70, less than or equal to 70 cc, with a core mismatch ratio, a penumbra to core mismatch ratio of 1.8, and a volume of potentially salvageable tissue of uh, 15 cc. So how can we apply this to wake-up stroke? Now, these are patients that are uh, <coughs> cardinally not been treated with, um, uh, generally with lytic therapy, but we have the Wake Up study, which was published a few months after the uh, 2018 International Stroke Conference, showing uh, the benefit of using MRI DWI flare mismatch to guide uh, in the appropriate patients uh, extended window thrombolytic therapy. And perfusion imaging has sort of been an extrapolation of defining infarct core, and there have been several studies showing the advantage of using infarct core to make those determinations. Um, or using sort of a mismatch, a penumbra and core mismatch. The wake-up study did not directly uh, reflect that. They used strictly MRI. And as it stands in the 2018 guidelines, there's a recommendation against, keeping in mind that this study was published after the, the guidelines were set forth, that there's a recommendation against treating wake-up patients outside of a clinical trial. And 
And uh, as many of you all know, there are ongoing clinical trials looking at this, looking at extended window uh, thrombolytic therapy based on either CT perfusion or MRI with or without perfusion. And I think that question still remains unanswered, but uh, we hope to have some answers based on these clinical trials in the next few years. So stroke mimics, how can perfusion imaging help in stroke mimics? Stroke mimics can cause characteristic changes in blood flow. For example, seizures, a common stroke mimic that we see, certainly I see in my clinical practice, can show almost the exact opposite response ictally during seizures where you have, due to increased metabolic demands, an elevated cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume in the location. So using your clinical exam, knowing, you know, that, the, uh, that you've got potentially what we call the uh, gaze deviation does not make sense with the territory of infarct as opposed to fitting with the criteria of what you would expect in a seizure going the opposite direction. Um, using that in combination with perfusion studies can be helpful in determining whether those patients are presenting with a large vessel occlusion or whether those patients are truly having uh, ongoing non-convulsive status epileptically. Postictally, however, we've seen hypoperfusion, and sometimes if in the, uh, can look almost like a wedge-like infarct, depending on, uh, on what vessel is involved or what uh, territory is involved and where the seizure activity is coming from. Certainly, if in the, uh, in the temporal lobe distribution, the parietal lobe distribution, you can be misinterpreting it as a large branch occlusion, which is the importance of having some vessel imaging to, uh, to know that there is patency of that vessel. And there's not really been anything that's panned out in assisting with hemiplegic migraines or press. It's sort of been, uh, uh, you know, one or the other direction in terms of changes in blood flow and blood volume in perfusion imaging. Now, in mild stroke, certainly not advocating for the use of perfusion imaging in mild stroke patients that are within window for TPA. I think a lot of uh, questions uh, still remain despite the PRISM study that was presented showing that uh, maybe um, in mild uh, strokes that we may be more aggressive or we have been more aggressive than maybe we ought to be. Um, there were some studies, uh, this gentleman, Felix Ng and his group looked at patients with a low NIH stroke scale, um, less than or equal to three, and looked for a demonstrable uh, penumbra with P, uh, CT perfusion imaging. And he and his group showed the benefit uh, at 90 days uh, with using TPA or Alteplase in these, uh, in these patients. Now, I think that TPA, and I think most of us will agree that the decision for TPA is a clinical decision strictly based on non-contrast CT and the clinical picture and whether those symptoms are disabling to that patient or not, whether contraindications or relative contraindications have been met or not. Um, I'm not advocating for the use of perfusion imaging, but it's something, it's a tool that you have in your toolbox if there is that patient that you really can't make a decision. This may be something that you can potentially additionally use, although timing is, is, is a big piece of it. You know, it may make a difference if you're at an institution where it's going to require semi-automated calculations and it's gonna take 10 to 20 minutes for post-processing and then another uh, few minutes for interpreting that value. It's, it may not be worth it in that institution, whereas some other institutions that may have automated softwares that can get this information within an order of a minute or two, maybe in those, in those institutions this could be something that could be used. Um, <clears throat> other applications, certainly I, I've been toying with the idea. Uh, we get a, uh, in our center, we've got a large cardiac population, patients that have known old pacemakers placed or old leads. Um, LVAD patients, balloon pump patients, patients that unfortunately are unable to get an MRI because of metal for whatever reason, and we are oftentimes unable to define the core early on, uh, you know, and depending on the type of stroke that they're presenting with, it may not be something that shows up on the CT scan the following day or the day after. And in those cases, there could be some utility using CT perfusion in the right patient population to define uh, the core of an infarct. Certainly, um, in those patients that you're expecting a thrombectomy, I don't think that they should be treated any differently. Uh, if they've got an anterior large vessel occlusion and they're outside of the window, then the extended window is certainly used. Perfusion imaging, CT perfusion, probably would be the way to go uh, in those cases. So now getting to the crux of the, of the matter, which is the software, and I'll go fairly quick here. Um, there's many uh, software tools currently available on the market both for CT perfusion as well as MR perfusion. There are two uh, major groups of algorithms that are involved without going too much in detail. The convolution 
and the deconvolution model. Um, the three automated FDA-approved softwares that we came across uh, are RAPID, uh, which many of you are aware of and was used in the uh, majority of the recent clinical trials, Oleosphere, which was also used in the Thrace cl uh, clinical trial, and then viz.ai, that AI stands for artificial intelligence. So RAPID by a schema view <clears throat> uses a delay and sensitive algorithm. They define MSPARC core or ischemic core by uh, relative cerebral blood flow less than 30% of normal tissue. This is with CT perfusion, of course. When you're looking at uh, DWI or with MRI, you're looking at an ADC threshold of less than 620 to define the MSPARC core. And then regardless, the hypoperfusion or the uh, penumbra is calculated as a Tmax delay is greater than six seconds. And you can see a map of, of core there in the, in the pink, purple, and then the uh, penumbra and the green there on the right-hand side. The Olea sphere is something new that we've sort of come across. It is also a fully automated um, uh, software that has a post-processing time of, uh, of one minute. One of the benefits uh, that the authors uh, and the, the scientists talk about is that they use a local arterial input function. That means that they're looking at the arter arteries solely on the side of the, uh, of the infarct rather than a global arterial input function, which, is, which they characterize at least to be much more accurate for determining blood flow, blood volumes, and mean transit times. Um, there's contrast dose reduction, and it's, uh, it's automated, can give you sort of a, a clear-cut map to read, as you can see there on this mobile device. The Viz AI software uses artificial intelligence and deep learning to automatically identify large vessel occlusions on CTA imaging. So, this is sort of, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's not the most specific, but it's quite sensitive at picking things up that show a hyperdense vessel or, a hyper, uh, you know, a cutoff on a CT angiography and can analyze CT perfusion maps. Um, we're not aware that it can certainly send emails, but I know that there's a mobile map that you can use that can allow, give you a, a map of cerebral blood volume, cerebral blood flow, uh, mean transit times, Tmaxes, and such that you can threshold uh, to determine whether this patient is a, could potentially be a candidate for or intervention. And we'll go quickly. These are now the semi-automated. These are not automated. So these are generally softwares that are coming on the CT scanners themselves. This one specifically is a Singo, uh, Singo on the Siemens scanner. They use uh, both a deconvolution and a maximum slope model, which is not very um, uh, important to discern. But what I want you to keep, uh, keep track of here is look at the varying differences of how to define core and penumbra here. You can see that they define core as cerebral blood volume less than 1.2 mLs per 100 mLs uh, of brain tissue, and then the penumbra is defined as a CBF of less than 35. Um, and it's, it's variable for virtually every one of the CT scanners uh, that, are, that are out there. Um, the Philips CT perfusion package uses a delay and sensitive algorithm, and they use mean transit times to determine penumbra, a mean transit time greater than 145, uh, percent compared to the contralateral normal hemisphere or thought to be normal hemisphere. They define the ischemic core by using two values, a mean transit time of greater than 145 percent, but also has to have a cerebral blood volume of less than two. That is also different from the previous uh, software. Here's the uh, Philips Extended Brilliance Workstation. Uh, you can see here that they use a mean transit time of greater than seven seconds or a uh, 145 percent of the normal contralateral tissue to determine penumbra. They use uh, CBV less than 2 ml per grams of brain tissue to define the infarct core. And yet another semi-automated uh, software, this is another version, um, uses a mean transit time rather than the 145%, they use 1.5 times, really 150% compared with the contralateral side. So even within the same manufacturers, there are differences uh, in, in the uh, techniques that are used to define core and penumbra, which leads to significant differences in interpretation not to mention the differences that can lead from uh, the, the, the user that's defining the arterial input function as well as the parenchymal tissue or the range of interest. Um, and that concludes my talk. Here are sort of the references. A good number of papers and a lot of work has been done looking at uh, sort of this exciting advanced imaging to determine patient selection for acute uh, therapy. And I think we're really in an exciting time in, in the world of stroke. Uh, where we're now trying to use a surrogate measure. I wouldn't say it completely replaces the time window, but truly using a surrogate measure, hopefully getting to a point in time where we don't really have a ceiling, that every patient is going to be treated individually, 
and based on certain imaging findings and characteristics and clinical characteristics um, uh, may be a candidate for many of these therapies as therapies become safer, more widely used, experiences better. And with that, I, can, uh, I think we have a couple of minutes for some questions. Yes, definitely. Dr. Gaudia, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. Um, if anyone would like to come off mute with star six to ask questions, and I'll also see if we had any um, questions come through online. Again, you can use star six to unmute your lines. Nope, no questions online. Let me pull up that panel. Um, just some praise of people thoroughly enjoying your presentation, so thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you all for, for listening. I hope that there was uh, some takeaway from this. I know a lot of physics involved, but this is really a confusing topic for a lot of, uh, a lot of people, including myself, when I, when I introduced myself to perfusion imaging. But this is going to become a reality. It already has become a reality in, in stroke triage, and I think everyone uh, you know, uh, will work on becoming much more comfortable at, at interpreting these advanced imaging studies, just like we were comfortable, you know, everyone was uncomfortable initially with CT imaging and then with CTA imaging. Now we've become comfortable with that. We're now going to push the envelopes to advanced imaging uh, the same way. Any, would anyone like to come off mute with star six to ask a question? So just as a reminder, we'll be sending a copy of the slides the recording to today's webinar and your certificate of, of participation in about two weeks, um, along with information for our next call happening at the end of April. I don't see any more questions coming in. Again, just everyone thanking us and thanking you for giving your time and expertise. Sure. Well, we'll go ahead and end the call. So thank you so much, Dr. Gaudier. We appreciate you um, sure. presenting for us today. Thank you so thank much. You, everyone. Ah, uh -huh. bye-bye.